Welcome to today's podcast. We have with us the managing editor of Incident Prevention Magazine, Kate Wade. She also helps produce the publication of Utility Fleet Professional Magazine. Kate has been the editor of IP for over 15 years and is going to explain some of the behind the scenes of the publication for folks that don't know and add a face to the name. Welcome to the podcast, Kate, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Nick. It's good to be here. So a lot of people know maybe the name, uh, and maybe they don't, but IPs, you know, uh, become a staple in the industry with timely topics, tons of great education. You know, tailgate topics has been a very popular uh, section of the magazine, um, but they may not know you. And you're an interesting part of the story, and, and we're going to dive a little deeper into that portion. Um, you know, what got you interested in becoming an editor? Were you always on that career path? You know, and, and what, what got you interested in, in the field? So I've always been a really big reader uh, ever since I was very small. And I remember being in, I don't know, probably middle school and I had a, my typewriter, you know, and I would make these little magazines um, and I would give them to my neighbors and stuff like that. So I think it's always been like a thing. I always liked uh, reading uh, publications. My first kind of foray into any of that world was uh, it's my first real job after college. I had interned for a daily newspaper where I lived and I worked there for about a year. And then my career sort of got a little weird. Uh, I moved to Chicago and well, actually before that, I, I worked for the daily paper. I then worked for a public relations firm in Connecticut uh, I don't know, for like six months. And then I moved to Chicago and um, I went through an agency and they got me a job um, at a company that produced magazines like hair magazines and then one like lifestyle magazine for women. Didn't love the management at the company, so I left there after about a year. Um, and then I was uh, like an administrator for like three years while I got my paralegal certification. Oh, wow. And yeah, so I mean, it kind of went all over the place. Uh, I worked as a paralegal for a while. I then got hired by a company called CS Stars, which I think is just part of Marsh McLennan now. But anyway, so I worked there in their compliance division. And so I was um, basically doing like IT work and creating um, different products for for different things that we had that we offered. Um, but one of the things I did was help with the, the audits. Uh, we had a product that was called Stars Audit and people could do like environmental health and safety audits um, mm -hmm. through that software. So I had a little bit of experience with that. And when my husband and I got married, we moved out to the suburbs and I didn't really want to commute downtown anymore. So I started looking for a job out here. Um, you you live in the same county as I do. You know, uh, the job situation is not ideal in our county. Um, so what ended up happening is I put an ad about myself in Craigslist back before Craigslist oh, wow. was, this, was the scary place. Um, and I was like, hey, these are my skills, you know. Uh, is there anybody out there? And so uh, Carla Houch, the publisher of Incident Prevention, found uh, me through there. And we had a conversation, a couple of interviews. And I was initially hired to do business development, which, you know, was fine. Um, maybe not my strong, <laughs> my strong suit. I don't know if sales and that kind of thing is really my my top skill. Um, but it got me in and learning about the business. And one of the great things about Carla is that she's really good at finding out like what people are good at and also giving them the bandwidth to try other things. So even though I started as business development, she knew I had a background uh, in writing and editing and we were a small company. So I just sort of jumped in and was helping. And eventually, uh, yeah, I just became the outright editor. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that for over a decade. Oh, wow. Well, I would say even, you know, I know you came in, uh, like you said, doing business development, but it kind of lends a hand to what you do working with all these different writers for IP and um, helping develop, you know, phenomenal articles that all of our readers um, get to learn from and share with their organizations. So, but that's interesting. I didn't know about the Craigslist and that is how fitting that you wrote 
you know, an article or a little about work myself. Without, you know, yeah. on without and, and that's how you ended here. So I, I learned something too. Oh, uh, good. You know, obviously the industry is changing. Uh, we're, we're definitely getting more um, females uh, in the utility industry and in the fleet industry, but still, uh, you know, majority is male dominated. And how do you feel, you know, operating in that? What, you know, it's nice probably to have, uh, to kind of be a role model yourself to potential, you know, young girls that see you and, and didn't think they could do something like that in a male dominated industry. Well, I think one of the nice things, you know, I, it is male dominated, but I guess I don't really like always think in those terms. Um, and I think a lot of that is because most of the people that I end up working with, they don't make a big deal about it. You know, it's like, it's not a thing about sex or gender or any of that kind of stuff. I think it's helpful that the owner of the company of our company is a woman, you know, so even though it's, there's a lot of men in the industry, you know, honestly, our, our office has been heavily female for like the bulk of my employment. And yeah, I really, I don't think that the male female thing has really bothered me or been an issue for me. You know, I would love to see more women in this industry. And and I wonder if some of it isn't just um, what we teach kids when they're younger. Like, I mean, maybe you don't want to be a line worker. You might not want to like, or you might not have the physical strength to do it. Like, who knows? But I think there are lots of areas where women can go into utilities or utility safety and not have to worry about like their gender. But we have to let girls know that those kind of jobs are available Mm -hmm. um, and encourage them to, you know, look into that kind of thing if it's interesting to them. And I, and I think that's the same with any profession really is like, you know, when you have young kids, you say you can do anything you want. Here are all of the different options and let them sort of lead the way in terms of what's interesting to them. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, my parents always saying you could be whatever you want to be. Um, but I think you're seeing more examples uh, on real life than, you know, when I was, uh, kind of coming up, especially for, for females. So, you know, that's really cool. And there's a lot of ways that, like you're saying, and um, areas that women, females can offer value. Maybe it's not a traditional lineman role, but there's, you know, if there's safety roles, there's a lot of different avenues, even yourself being in, you know, an editor role in the utility safety world. Um, and you're offering value that way. So uh, I think that's really cool. Um, well, I think a lot of people, like, I didn't even know that this was, like, an option for me. I mean, I knew, like, I like I wanted to be in, like, the writing and editing world. Traditionally, I didn't think about trade publications. And now, because think times have changed, you know, when I got out of school in the 90s, paper was still, like, a thing. You know what I mean? Like, you read magazines, you read newspapers, like black and white in your hand and so i was always just thinking about like consumer publications like you go to a store and you see what's on the shelves there so i guess i would say for parents and for you know younger people who are looking into different lines of work is there's so much out there that like you just don't know that you don't know about so the more you can investigate um talk to people find people who like work in a specific industry that you might be interested in and see if they'll mentor you or have conversations with you. Like, I think those are all good ideas just to open your mind about what's possible. Yeah. And that's, it's actually a really good segue into, you know, I was kind of curious, did you have any role models or mentors coming up? Anyone you look to for guidance that shaped your path? Gosh, I, I've always struggled with this question, um, not just from you, but like from everyone. I, I haven't, I haven't had a lot of what I would call role models or, you know, Things like that. I mean, there have been people I know I don't want to be like. Um, so that, yeah. that, <laughs> that helps. That you know helps. what I mean? But um, I, I also haven't met a lot of women that are doing what I'm doing now. So like that's been a struggle um, too in terms of like who do I look to for advice? But having Carla, you know, our publisher around has been hugely beneficial for me because I think one, like she made me I think she made me kinder, to be very honest with you. Um, you know, she's always put our readers, our customers, our clients first. Um, and even now, all of these years later, like that's one of the things about our company. It's a small company and we really pride ourselves on having 
uh, good customer service, really connecting with our readers, our advertisers, our writers, so that we can have these good relationships because the better relationships you have, the better your end product is going to be. And when you're talking about, you know, trying to save people from hurting or uh, killing themselves, like that kind of stuff is really important. And so, yeah, I mean, Carla, I, I really think like if I have any role models for the job that I'm doing now, it would be her. Yeah. And um, I'll reiterate that. I mean, obviously, Carla is, is my boss as well as she's CEO uh, of Utility Business Media, but she also, you know, she founded the um, CUSP certification, which a lot of folks may not know with Pam and, and Jim and Mac and all the people that we we know, but she started it at her kitchen table with those folks and to grown into an industry staple that it is today. But that was, that came from her mind, um, as well as the publications. So yeah, I would, I would, I would echo that she, um, she's definitely someone to look to as a mentor. So I want to go into a little bit more into, into utility safety and dive into that. You know, we all know that the landscapes evolved over the last 15 years since you started, you know, what significant changes for utility safety have you realized, experienced by working with these folks? Any anything that stands out to you? How the industry maybe has adapted, you know, to the changes? Yeah, obviously we had the big OSHA rule revision back in 2014, so that one was was big uh, for a long time. Um, you know, we got 100% fall protection now, which wasn't a thing when I came into the business. I think one of the things that I'm seeing um, over time is this focus more on, I guess, what we would call soft skills. You know, we I, I feel like we've almost reached a tipping point, like where we have great training, you know, available in companies like we we have all of like the the physical kind of stuff under control for the most part. Um, but I think now there's more of a focus on, you know, kind of some of the things that I talk about with Bill Martin, like the um, the neuroscience, like how do our brains work? And with more information on how our brains work, how does how do we translate that information into utilities and into the training um, so that we can use that to keep people safer, to connect them, you know, do all these things. So. I really think that's kind of like where we are and sort of where we're headed. And then also like, you know, as AI and things like that come into play, we'll we'll see more of that kind of thing. But just like off the cuff, those are the things that pop into my head. Yeah, no, I think soft skills, you know, is, is a good thought. Bill's opened my mind as well to that and um, connecting with people, you know, the the way the younger generation is learning is a lot different from even Bill's generation. Well, that's one of the other things is like, you know, the generational stuff. So we've had all these different generations in the workplace, but we've also had a lot of people, a lot of boomers retiring and continuing to retire. So I think there's going to be, you know, even changes there as they age out and younger people come in. I think we will see changes in how people communicate and, and probably some things that we might not even know that we don't know yet. You know what I mean? Like, who knows yeah. what the future could bring? Yeah, I mean, um, I know one area that sticks out in my mind is is it used to be a uh, kind of a a command relationship. You did what your superior, you know, told you. To do. Military, yeah, military. military style, command and control. Exactly, yep. and didn't ask you know questions. And the younger generation is asking, well, why am I doing that, or what's the purpose of that? And um, yeah, so I think we'll definitely see a lot of outcomes as as the younger generation moves into those roles. So yeah, it's interesting that you said that soft skills are, are to, you know, are definitely an area I, I think have, have definitely changed over the last, you know, 15 years. Mm-hmm. You know, another thing, you know, you, you do a lot with content curation, obviously. And, uh, you know, as a managing editor, um, you have to work with a lot of outside talent and folks, you know, in the utility safety sector, you have to help craft articles and then also get them approved, which I, I recently learned um, and, and should have known, but I just wasn't involved <laughs> by by an independent board that reviews these articles for accuracy and and what we're saying and what we're putting out there is, is you know, correct. Can you talk a little bit about that process and 
you know, uh, for folks that don't know? Sure. Um, and, you know, the process has grown and changed slightly over time. But um, I, you know, one of the things that's really important, and I feel like I got good at this, you know, when in my first newspaper job is really just like reaching out to people and being like, hey, would you be interested in writing about this? And like, you know, can we work together to put something together? Um, because I don't know how many people know this, but incident prevention, the bulk of it is written by volunteers who work in the industry, um, who basically, you know, spend their time, talent, treasure, putting together articles for us to try to help other people. Um, so they're not, you know, they're not financially compensated. Um, and so it really, it's a labor of love because it's, you know, me going out and, and finding people who are willing to write and them, you know, having this subject matter expertise that they're willing to share with us. And so a lot of, you know, in terms of content curation, it's like, so I know we have readers from all levels, um, you know, people who have just entered the industry up to people who have been in the industry, you know, for 40 or 50 years. Um, so I try to include articles that, you know, kind of run the gamut, you know, so if you're brand new and you're just learning, we have articles for you know people who are at that level if you if you're in like a director level something like that we have stuff for you so that's one of the things that's important to me is to make sure that we're appealing to a range you know of, of subject matter expertise um, in our readers and you know some of it is me going out and and pitching to uh to people and saying hey will you write for us others as we grow um, I get more people who come and say, hey, I'm interested in working with you. These are my ideas and we can go that way. I also, um, I take a look at all the people who uh, submit to present at our conferences yeah. um, because often their, like their submissions, the presentations they want to do will work really easily into an article. And so what I like to do is for people who can't make it to the conference so they can still learn this information, even though they weren't able to travel to wherever our conference was. And so then, yeah, once I get the articles in, I try to make sure that for each issue, we kind of have like various topics. You know, you don't want like a, a lot of overlap. And, you know, so I work with the, with the authors and that's where the, the board comes in. So We've had this editorial advisory board for many years now. Um, Jim Vaughn sort of heads that up and has been one of our longstanding members. And they are just a really great group of guys who, again, volunteer their time to make sure that everything that we're putting out there makes sense is, you know, safety compliant for OSHA and any consensus standards um, and things like that. So we really go through a whole process on the back end before anything gets out to our readership, you know, and that's just in the interest of we want to be as accurate as possible to make sure that you people are as safe as possible. Yeah, no, I think that's important. And and a lot of folks may not know that, including myself until of recently, you know, um, it's important to put out accurate information as well as, you know, um, interesting information. So having that board review that um, for the accuracy portion is is phenomenal. And we have the same with the utility fleet profession, the same thing. And it's a different group. You know, it's all um, people who work in utility fleets. Um, and so they can advise us like if we're missing something. And sometimes, you know, the, the, their comments might not necessarily like make it into like that article, but it, it will. The feedback gives us ideas for other things that we need to cover in the future. So it's I think it's like anything else. The more eyes that you have on something, the more feedback you're going to get and the more likely you are to like cover all your bases and get it right. Yeah. And, and just for listeners, if you want to write an article, you know, if you want to get in contact with Kate, we'll make sure to include her email address in the description. Um, Kate, if you want to give it uh, for folks listening. Sure. It's K Wade, W-A-D-E at utilitybusinessmedia.com. And you can also find it on the uh, table of contents page on the inside of Incident Prevention Magazine. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's a great point. You know, we have our conference coming up. We have a lot of people who write articles in the magazine that also present at our conference. Um, you can actually, I mean, 
shameless plug for CUSP, you can submit for, uh, you know, a certification credit uh, for writing an IP. Plus, it gives you good visibility in the industry. Um, and a lot of folks have who have started writing for IP and, and maybe weren't known or have made consulting careers and things out of it because they, they've got really good information, really good advice, and people become aware of them. Well, and that's one of the things I want to point out is, you know, sometimes I know people are a little gun shy about writing because they're like, I'm not a professional writer, um, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think one of my specialties is, you know, I'm not an expert on utility safety. I'm, I've never been a, a line person. I've never worked at a utility. So my talents are editing what you write. So I think it's like a, you know, a great partnership. It's like you're providing your knowledge and then I can futz with it to make sure it reads really clean um, and everybody's happy. Yeah, no, I think that's important. I mean, I'm not a writing expert, as you know, and uh, <laughs> You know, that could scare some people away. But knowing that, look, this we're not going to, you don't just submit something and, and that's it, right? This is a partnership. It gets reviewed. It gets edited. You guys sign off and get approval on it. And you come out with a really clean, good product at the end. And um, I think that's important for people to know. I know it sounds scary sometimes to get asked to, to do something, but um, knowing that that backup is there, uh, I think alleviates a lot of that anxiety. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't want people to feel like it's all this pressure, or, like they're going to fail somehow. Like I'm here, I'm not here to like make you look bad. I'm here because I, I, you know, I think this work is important and yeah. And I just want to work with whoever wants to, you know, get their knowledge out there. If it's something like interesting and relevant to the industry. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, and I can attest that Kate does phenomenal work as she's directed many of my of my stuff. Um, so, you know, kind of looking to the future, uh, for IP, um, clearly technology is playing a huge role. Um, AI, you know, is on everyone's mind. Um, how do you see that, you know, trends maybe over the next five years and with technology and, and, uh, what do you think we can see forward to seeing an IP, you know, kind of covering technology. And I think we've done a couple, uh, in the last few issues here of IP. Yeah, we did um, that article with Barry Nelson from Factor Lab about harnessing AI, um, mm -hmm. and he, we also did a, a podcast a podcast interview with him. And I thought what he was talking about was really interesting about the different ways that we can use AI to um, make like our job briefings, our tailgates, things like that better, just by AI being able to like you know go through tons of information and kind of assess it. It, you know, in a way that humans would not have the time to do. So I think we're going to be seeing more of that, you know, things like uh, the product that Cobra Vision has, you know, where they can detect whether people are wearing their PPE and wearing it appropriately. We'll see more of that. Um, and then I think there are going to be things that we don't know yet, yeah. um, which I always get excited for because it's like, you know, I, even though Bill tells me, I can predict the future. I can't predict all of the future. Yeah. Um, and so I'm kind of excited just to see where things will go. I do think that our industry is, you know, a bit conservative in terms of like, and I think a lot of industries are. I mean, unless you're like in tech, you're like, okay, well, is this something that I want to bring in or not? And like, what are the benefits versus like, you know, the potential problems because we, I mean, privacy issues, all that kind of thing. We talk about it in UFP a lot um, because in fleets, you know, you have a lot of drivers who have these cameras that are basically tracking them all the time. And, you know, do you want to have a, a camera, like a one that's right in your face all the time, like checking out what you do and not everybody does. So I think there will be, you know, those kind of conversations too. How much do the pluses outweigh the minuses? So yeah, I'm just excited. I don't know all the things and I'm not going to pretend like I do, but whatever starts to come down the pipeline, we will definitely address it on the pages of Incident Prevention. Awesome. To close out, uh, you know, do you have any memorable articles that really kind of stick out in your mind over your 15 year career? I mean, clearly you've done a lot and I know that's a, a tough question, but is there anything <laughs> that 
maybe you really enjoyed working on or something that um, stands out in your mind that you were really proud of or? You know, honestly, I really am proud of this, uh, the whole San Diego Gas and Electric article that we did. I was like seeing it from the very beginning when you were like, hey, we're doing this tour at SCG&E, you know, we should do an article about it in the magazine and kind of just getting involved with that, getting to actually go to San Diego and be um, like at their site, uh, their their skills training center and, and learning all of these things. Also, my memory is terrible. So like, I mean, it's been like 15 years and I'm like over here going, what? I can't think of anything. Um, yeah. But really, I was proud because part of what happens to me is I edit so much um, stuff that other people have written that I don't get to write a lot anymore. And so this was like a chance for me to be like, okay, can I still do this? And um, and it was just fun. It was fun to go to San Diego. It was fun to be there. It was fun to see like what they're doing and just really cool. Uh, and then to be able to come back and like write about it, and, you know, see all the pictures and then see the final product, including the back of my head on the cover. Um, yeah, I like that. Right. So right. yeah, that, that was, it was good. And I think it was a really good um, representation of like, the cutting edge work that they're doing out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And I mean, I went on that tour, obviously I was in a different group than you, but you know, I, I thought it was a, uh, I got to see it from a different angle, but you know, like I said, talking to you about it initially and then going there, um, and seeing the final product is just phenomenal. It's, it's a beautiful article. It's in the December, January issue of IP incident hyphen prevention.com. If you'd like to see it digitally, but yeah, it's a really great article that Kate did, uh, beautifully represented uh, Lorraine, who lays out uh, our magazine, did a phenomenal job with some of the in-house photography and external photography with San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, their guy did a phenomenal job. So with that. But also, oh, thank God. you to Jeff. Thank you to Jeff Clemens for yes. facilitating all of that. Yes. Really appreciate it. Yes, Jeff Clements, uh, it, for the folks that don't know, he uh, was the board um, president uh, for the US OLN or the Utility Safety and Ops Leadership Network. He worked for San Diego Gas and Electric and was able to help facilitate that tour, you know, as well as Amanda. Forgive me because I'm trying to look her last. Meisner. I think it's I, Meisner. Yeah, she did a, a really great job of working with their staff, facilitating everything. I can't thank her enough. And I just wanted to, you know, close out and remind everyone, um, go to incident-prevention.com to view the articles online, to view and subscribe to the magazine if you haven't. Um, view our podcast. Kat, Kate actually has a podcast called Utility Safety In-Depth, um, where she dives deeper into some of the articles. And uh, as well as we have a spring conference coming up here in Orlando, Florida. It's not San Diego, but it's going to be sunny. It's going to be nice. It's at the... It's going to be yeah. hot. Yeah. Should, so it'll be nice to get out of the, uh, you know, cold weather. Um, and it's at the Creed Royale, which is a beautiful hotel. Uh, great for families right by, what is it, Disney there and uh, Universal. So um, that's from May 21st through the 23rd. And you can go to utilitysafetyconference.com. And Kate, thank you so much for spending time with us. We know you're busy and you're now at the end of the year so you're taking some you know a little bit of a break here before you get going in 24 on on ip but uh you know thank you for spending the time thank you nick this has been great yeah thank you all right everyone thanks for joining and uh tune in next time the views information and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of utility business media and its employees it is strongly recommended that you discuss any actions or policy changes with your company management prior to implementation.